Thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Zephaniah 3, verse 17, one verse this morning. And uh, I would love it, I would love it if, uh, please forget that joke and remember this, if the only, please remember this verse. Um, and what I'd love to share for the, for the few minutes that we have this morning. Uh, the Lord, your God, is in your midst. This is what it says. The Lord, your God, is in your midst. A warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. And so if I was a, if I was a Baptist preacher this morning, I would, be, I would be telling you three Ps. The Lord is with you, his presence. He's a warrior who gives victory, his power. He will rejoice over you with gladness, his passion. But I'm not going to do that. But just remember it in case you forget. His power, his presence, and his passion. The Lord, your God, is in your midst. A warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. But it goes on. It goes on. It just is the most beautiful picture of God. It's the most phenomenal uh, presentation of what he's like. He will quiet you with his love and he will rejoice over you with singing. Um, th th this verse has been called by many the, the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. Um, and I was struck by, struck by a quote uh, as a, a scholar, a guy, Jack Deere, he's an incredible pastor, scholar, theologian. As he, thought, as he was writing and reflecting on this verse, he said that many in the church today um, are convinced that God is angry with his people. Or I would even say many in the church today have convinced themselves that God is deeply disappointed with them. They have no idea how crazy he is about them. And I, and I, and I, and I, think, I think Jack Deere is, is right. I think something would shift in our hearts, something would shift in our minds if we reckoned, if we truly caught that he is crazy about us. And so this morning, th there is so much stuff we could go through from Genesis to Revelation and we could see all of the things that God says about us. And so th this morning, I'm not even talking about that because some of the things that he says, some of the things that he says about us are remarkable, but I'm not even talking just about what God says. I'm talking about what he feels. And William's already pointed that out this morning, just even in, in our time of communion, he, that, that Jesus shares his feelings. And so I don't know, I don't know what you've been, how you've been brought up or what sort of theology you have around this, but there is the doctrine of impassibility. And now that's not the Northern Irish way of saying impossible. Impassable. Impassibility. It's the doctrine, and it's, it's familiar with many people, that God is above passion. God does not feel passion. God does not have emotions. Effectively, that God cannot be affected by something outside of himself. That is the doctrine of impassibility. Impassible meaning he he has, there is, he has no emotions. He, has, uh, he is above passion, cannot be affected by something that is outside of himself. And so for some people listening to what William has shared this morning could possibly be upset that Jesus, Jesus is sharing his feelings. And I think Jesus, was, we say this so often here, if we want to know what God is like, if we want to know what the Father is like, we look to Jesus. And Jesus certainly, we see over and over again, passionate emotions from Jesus. Times of anger, times of deep, deep compassion that overflowed into, into, into weeping. Um, all sorts of passionate emotions. 
And I just, without getting bogged down into this doctrine of impassibility, I just want to, I just want to tell you pretty strongly. I think it is, it is flawed. Um, even think like, I'm not going to go down too far, but just even the idea of empathy. Like empathy is one of those characteristics that I admire so much in people. I think it is probably one of the most beautiful, uh, beautiful things when people show empathy. Like that has to be that has to be a characteristic of God. How can we how can we how can we compliment and praise people for being empathetic and think that that is not uh, the same type of characteristic that comes from God? For him to be empathetic, he needs to feel for him to be empathetic he needs to be affected by something outside of himself and so that's just one emotion I think the other emotions that I think that we don't always associate as a divine attribute is joy and and so if we were to go to go to, to the gospels to go to the red letters of Jesus John 15 as Jesus is knows that his time is coming to an end He's speaking his final words to his disciples. He says to them, I've said all of these things to you. I've said all of these things to you so that my joy would be in you and that your joy would be complete. And I think everything that Jesus said towards the end of his life in John 14, 15, 16, and 17 is incredibly intentional. And I, and I think he's, even these words that he speaks in John 15, 11, he knows that there will be moments and moments not too far away, the, the, the challenge that Peter had, the challenge that all of the disciples had, the challenge that even is not alien to any of us in this room, tempted at times to give up, tempted, uh, or just there's times when it gets too hard. And I think Jesus knew that the one thing that will keep you going is that the that the their joy in knowing God's joy in them. Whenever it got hard, whenever they were tempted to give up, to know the knowledge of his joy in them would keep them going. And so to come back to these, to come back to this verse, Zephaniah 317, he becomes quiet. Can you picture this? I wish I was better at painting a, a, a picture for you in your mind. But try to picture the, the God of the universe, the creator, becoming quiet as he reflects on his deep affection for you. It's just one thing to, to, it's one thing to reflect on what God says. But I'm asking you this morning to reflect on what he feels. To reflect on how you, like you individually, whoever you are sitting in your seat, as he reflects on his deep affection for you, he becomes quiet. It's a love that is so deeply felt. It's a love that is so deeply felt. I don't know whether this is right or not, but I'm just reflecting on this this morning. There's times that we become maybe agitated or frustrated by by what we feel is his silence. I want to suggest to you this morning that silence is not a sign of his disinterest. His what seems like silence to you is not a sign of his disinterest. It's not a sign of his distance, but it's a sign of his enjoyment. It's a sign of his affection. And maybe you're feeling that at the, in these last days or weeks that there's just maybe been a silence. And I want you to maybe think about it differently. His silence is not disinterest. It's not distance. He's quiet and over you with his love. He has deep affection for you. He has a love for you that is so deeply felt. And that is beautiful and I think it is remarkable. And I think if we could catch it, it would do something profound in us. 
but it even gets it even gets better, I think. Because how is the silence broken? He will require it over you with his love, and he will rejoice over you with singing. The thing that breaks the silence, the silence is broken as God begins to sing over you. The silence is broken as God begins to sing about you. And maybe that's like, that's so challenging to get our head around a wee bit. This morning we've come to sing to him, to worship him, to sing about him. But there's something about how God sees us. Something about his love for us that is so deeply felt that there'll be times that it'll cause him to be quiet. Such as, such as he feeling the love for you. And there's times that the silence is broken and begins to sing. When he begins to sing about you. When he begins to sing over you. And there are other, t- there are other places that we could go throughout the scriptures um, to reflect on this sort of like mutual rejoicing in one another. And so Isaiah 65, um, God says, I will rejoice in Jerusalem. I will delight in my people. The message version says, I'll create Jewish Jerusalem as sheer joy, create my people as pure delight. And so his joy in us, his joy in, in us provides a response from us. And so in Isaiah 61, we read that uh, we read these verses, I will sing and greatly rejoice in Yahweh. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. And the thing about singing, and it's what I it's what I'd love us to, to reflect on over the, the Sundays in the summer. Because I don't know, I, th- I imagine we're all the same. I think we remember, it's probably true that we remember more what we sing than what we hear. And I've never been more convinced of this. I probably should, like, I probably should say that about songs of worship that we sing on a Sunday. But I've n- never more convinced of that um, than a few weeks ago. I always listen to talk sport. But every so often when Jade is in the car, she'll get me to put on Cool FM. So Cool FM was still on in the car a couple of weeks ago. And I didn't know this was a thing, but apparently it's an it's a ongoing part of the programming that they're uh, songs from the 90s. And so I'm in the car, and for about half an hour, these songs from the 90s that I haven't heard since the 90s came on. And I am, bl- and I am like driving through Portadown, singing Shania Twain at the top of my voice. And straight after Shania Twain, Chumbawamba comes on, Venga Boys, like Barbie Girl. I'm like, I cannot help but sing them. Almost embarrassed that I remember every song from Barbie Girl. Anyway, that's almost like a confession. Just recognizing that I remember, remember more what we sing than what we hear. And so Warren, Warren Wearsby, again, another credible pastor, incredible theologian, He said this, he said, I am convinced that congregations learn more theology, good or bad, from the songs they sing than from the sermons they hear. Many sermons are doctrinally sound and contain a fair amount of biblical information, but they lack that necessary emotional content that gets a hold of the listener's heart. Music, however, reaches the mind and the heart at the same time. It is power to touch the emotions and to move the emotions. And for that reason, can become a wonderful tool in the hands of the Spirit. And so what I'm asking of you, I know there's already been some stuff that's been asked of you in terms of like volunteering over the summer or if you're free to host a Wednesday. But what I'm asking for the Sundays over July and August is that if right now there's there's a song, as I've read that, even as I've read that quote, as I've talked about uh, good theology coming from songs, that that there's a song in your mind that you're reflecting on, a song that um, that has helped, a song that has provoked. And so over the Sundays, 
I'd love to give space for that. We're going to share. Um, we'd love to like I don't know, this interview style. Whether you want to come and chat about your about a song, the theology, the richness of a of a song that has impacted you. Um, that's what we're going to do on our Sundays. And so it can be tricky at times for, for people to come and say there, there is a song because that means that you're willing to sort of stand up here and share about it. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. But if there is one song that you want to talk about and share about, to unpack some of the theology around it um, for me or somebody else to talk about, please do that. Um, if you're willing to take 20 minutes to unpack it, the floor is yours. Um, but that's what that's what I'd love to do over over the over the summer, sharing time to share favorite songs, time to share the theology from your favorite songs. Almost a wee bit of what we were even trying to do with the men. Like where 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 have you found God in the music? Where have you found God in in music and in song? Ideally, it'll be songs of it'll be songs of. Worship that we sing on a Sunday, but just to just so you know, like I've I've had this experience once. I don't think I've, I'm not sure I've had it again. Um, but there's a song by the Goo Goo Dolls called Aris, and uh, and I know it's, it's not it's not it's not packed with theology. It's not even about God. But I remember it was it wasn't that long after after my dad's dad, my granda, had passed away. That song came was on the radio. And towards the like toward I can't remember just in the middle of the song, uh, it, it's it's it, the singer sang these words. When everything's made to be broken, um, I just want you to know who I am. And for what like for whatever for whatever reason, just in that moment felt like I found God in the music, found something deeply impacted, deeply provoked me. As you're reflecting on death and loss, when everything's made to be broken, I just, I, I just want you to know who I am. So I suppose I share that to let you know there's a freedom. Like to sh- if there's stories that what music has done, how it's impacted relationship or engagement with God, we, we want July and August to be a chance to do that. But more than anything, more than anything, please, please remember this verse in Zephaniah three seventeen. Please know how you make God feel. Where you sit right now, something about his love for you that is so deeply felt that it causes him to be quiet. And every so often, he cannot help but burst out in song. His affection for you becomes so much that he bursts out in song as he sings and rejoices over you. And so, Father, I pray that that would be our experience not only that we would we would know that god but there would be something about the knowledge of that that would cause us deep joy that your joy would be in us and that our joy would be complete so god we um we pray that you would that you would speak god we pray that you would confirm this and uh, and solidify this picture this idea this reflection of who you are and your nature in each one of our, of our hearts and minds. That God, whenever we, whenever we come up against this week, whatever we're faced, whatever conversations that we have, whatever challenges that we need to face, God, we would remember how we make you feel. And God, that, that, and that would provide a response from us. That would provide a worshipful response from us that would provide a response of commitment and hunger and desire from us as we reflect on that. So thank you that you're with us. Thank you that you love us, that you're for us. I pray that we go with that knowledge into this week and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you all. Thanks for being here this morning. Have a great week.